Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Prasanna Vijayanathan. I'm here with my awesome colleagues, Praveen and Nitin Pasumati here. And we are here to talk to you about how we've been using AI to personalize the performance for every member when they connect to LinkedIn.com. Before we get into the crux of the story, Going back in time. Uh, not a lot, maybe a few months when I was here for the previous summit talking about a performance experiment that we ran. The goal of the experiment was to figure out what our members like to experience on LinkedIn. Do they like a really fast, light version of the app with limited features, or would they like a really heavy app, something that uh, updates your profile based on your how your morning meeting goes and feed your cat at the same time. Maybe not, but you get the idea. A really heavy app that's going to be loaded with features but slower versus a lighter app that is limited on features but much faster. And because these experiments with performance don't happen out in the wild very often, we took this opportunity to learn about um, gain more insights into what makes members uh, prefer certain types of experiences. In order to do that, we used certain uh, metrics to that, that encompass features like what network people connect on and what devices they are using, what browsers they are using, and so on, uh, defining characteristics of what a member would experience as performance in in the end, and use that to uh, classify, uh, based on historical performance data, classify them into fast, average, and slow performance. And then when we ran the experiment, we said, let's randomly choose members in each of those cohorts and give some of them the lighter experience and the others the heavier experience. Then we went on and defined certain metrics to identify what happened, basically. First up, page load speed, which is uh, the latency they experience when the app loads. Right? Um, with page load speed, as expected, we saw the page load speed increase, improve drastically on the lighter app, uh, and the improvement gradient increases from fast to slow members. Right? This is expected. The next. Uh, metric we are looking at is the number of members coming to the app. Think of it as quantity, right? So when we gave them the lighter app, members tend to come to the app more frequently. So we saw an improvement in the number of members coming to the app when it's lighter and faster. And that was across the board. The faster members, the average and slow performing members, all of them came to the app because they probably liked the lighter version better. Good? Okay. Here's where things getting interesting. Sessions. Think of sessions as uh, quality, as in when a member comes to the app, how long do they stay on the app for? Right? It's a measure of that. And when we looked at that, we did see improvement across the board. But what was interesting was there was, this wasn't consistent across uh, the three cohorts. We saw that the fast and slow users tend to stay on the app longer than the average uh, cohort members when they were given the lighter app. And that brought up the question, is this where the tipping point is between speed and features? And this question also prompted us asking about what is happening? Like, why would there be certain members who would be different from others? What is causing this disparity? And the answer to that pretty much came to some of the topics we've covered today. The diversity in performance. If you think of uh, where LinkedIn operates, we operate at a global scale. Hundreds of countries, Beyond that, there are thousands of cities, 
uh, numerous regions, latitude, longitudinal uh, diversity. Uh, at that level, it is hard to even say and classify uh, performance of certain regions in certain ways. To add to that, there is diversity in the time type of networks you're connecting from. You can connect from your Wi-Fi devices, gigabit ethernet connections to the really slow 2G networks across the globe. And then take into account all the numerous device form factors that we have, uh, the really high performing high end devices, mobile phones compared to the really low end devices as well across the globe. All that diversity in devices, browsers, network characteristics add to how diverse performance is. So what does that really mean for performance now? Uh, there are so many granularity, so much granularity in the diversity that influences performance today. Then does it mean that we need to start customizing for each use case? Maybe. And that thought gave rise to our initiative, personalizing performance. We want to customize what a member experiences on LinkedIn every time they connect to LinkedIn and give them the best performance possible for each member. Cool, that sounds really good to us, hopefully to you too. But what do we have to do that? Today what we have is data, like most of us here. We can use all that data to understand what a member prefers, what they like on LinkedIn. But the challenge is also in scaling to every member, millions and millions of users coming to us every day, how do you scale? And the answer to this, as is for a lot of things in the industry today, AI. So we, we went through this path and we picked out one use case to see if we can really use AI effectively and that's what we're gonna to talk to you about. It's a service we built, network quality as a service. And the goal was pretty straightforward. Understand every time a user connects to LinkedIn.com, understand the network quality, and then uh, give out that information to any other service at LinkedIn. They can play around with that information, whatever they want to do. Pretty straightforward. But why is this hard? Think about this. The challenge is, how do you even know that a member is experiencing good or bad or average network qualities? when they connect, because it's very subjective. We could be sitting on a gigabit ethernet connection and the page takes 1.6 seconds to load and I might be frustrated because it's slow, but someone else on a 2G network sitting somewhere else would be experiencing a five or six second page load and they're like, yeah, this is workable, right? So this is an extremely subjective topic and we're still trying to comprehend what performance means to each member. That in itself is hard, a slightly lesser hard problem uh, is how do we even do this in real time? If I want to measure network quality, I need to take some time to do that. Maybe on my native apps, I can run something in the background and figure something out. But what about web? There are some information that's available today, not very concrete. So the question comes down to, if I want to do this in real time to understand the quality of a network, will it be, on time, that was the biggest challenge in this use case for us. And that's when it was time to turn to our performance AI experts. And they'll tell you today how to AI. Thanks, Prasanna. So uh, I'm Praveen. So uh, I'll just continue from uh, how to AI. So now that we have enough motivation for how we can personalize performance using AI, uh, we, we now look at a particular use case at LinkedIn where we use this to serve better to our members. And uh, it's called uh, LinkedIn Lite. So it's basically a light 
uh, version of LinkedIn, which is catered towards uh, serving our members in the uh, emerging markets, and it aims to provide like a lighter and a faster uh, experience for members in those regions. And uh, we typically face two types of challenges with these members. So one, the devices might not be very uh, high performant or powerful. There might most of them would be uh, low end devices. The second type of uh, challenge would be uh, the network conditions can be challenging in these regions. And uh, here we could leverage uh, the uh, capacity of NQS to serve our members better by uh, deciding real time what type of uh, content or what quality of content we want to serve to these members. So uh, this is uh, typically how uh, NQS is implemented for LinkedIn Lite. So, uh, the main objective here is to kind of decide uh, the network quality class that a member uh, would belong to, which would be typically like a good a good class or a bad class or an average class. And uh, uh, we use some features which would help us uh, achieve this objective. And uh, we use different techniques to come up with uh, what features we choose to uh, uh, to run our models through and model is basically like a, you can think of like a map or mapping function which would uh, give us the objective using these features and uh, we'll go about uh, the features in the next couple of slides so uh, coming to the first part the data and uh, the data that we use for NQS is called uh, real uh, user monitoring data uh, this is like one of the very popular ways of collecting performance metrics and uh, how this basically works is on the client side uh, we run a JavaScript uh, which would uh, collect performance metrics and send out a post beacon uh, like every time it collects and we get metrics like uh, uh, network network qual network metrics or timing metrics and we also get uh, information about the device browser and things like that and we use this as our source of truth to extract our features and also uh, extract our uh, labels uh, out of this data and uh, with data it's it's really important to understand our data before we start doing anything with the modeling or any of the next steps. So we need to understand what features we need to use, how these feature features interact with each other, and uh, what are the distributions. And basically, we look for uh, any weird data that might throw off your model uh, analysis because uh, garbage in is garbage out. So how well our model performs is highly dependent on the quality of the data that we have. And uh, understanding and being the master of data would uh, help us avoid these problems and also help us what uh, to uh, know what kind of uh, cleaning that we need to do on our data before we go on to uh, the modeling part. So uh, the next step is feature engineering, which is uh, just like how I explained, we uh, kind of came up with these four categories of features and we thought that th this would help us uh, classify our uh, objective into three classes basically so one is geography which is the city or country uh, diversity uh, that the user uh, is in the second is the network which is basically the uh, internet service provider or the class of network i mean whether the user is connected on wi-fi or uh, 3g and things like that and the third is device uh, this is important because even though the network is like really strong sometimes the device might be the bottleneck because the passing and rendering might be slow on a low end device and similarly the browser name and uh, one thing to keep in mind is that we use NQS during the initial stages of user engagement to kind of decide what uh, uh, what content we serve, the quality of the co content. So these features that we choose should be uh, available during the initial stages of user engagement. And uh, with features, yeah, uh, we can we can broadly classify these features into numeric and categorical numeric features are simple they are basically numbers which would be consumed by our uh, model directly and categorical are uh, 
these are uh, string values uh, examples would be something like a browser name or a device name or data center and we need to uh, do some encoding and convert them to numbers before the models can consume them and uh, the challenging part uh, we faced was most of uh, most of our features were categorical and we had to do a lot of work on feature engineering before like to convert them to numbers uh, before uh, we trained our models on and uh, as I was telling, we have three uh, output classes, and uh, the way we identified these three classes was like we looked at the historic RAM data, and uh, we looked at the percentile distribution of the page load time, and using our uh, like domain knowledge, we kind of draw drew boundaries uh, on the percentile distribution to uh, come up with good average and bad page load times. So. Uh, now that we have the input data and the uh, objective uh, coming to the modeling part, so we tried like a uh, few techniques with modeling and uh, few important things with modeling is it's very important to start simple and set a baseline and have a sense of how uh, features are uh, working out and uh, yeah how, how basically a model is working and then we iterate on making the model better and tune the model uh, to get the best performance out of it. And uh, the first technique that we tried was, uh, it's, it's called decision trees, they are pretty simple. And uh, specifically in decision trees, we tried this technique called XGBoost. So decision trees are basically tree-like structures and uh, uh, this is how it this is a example which would help you give an intuition of a decision tree with respect to nqs so each each node is basically an if else clause and it would try to make a best split of the input data uh, so that uh, you you have different categories on each of the leaves and each leaf would give us how confidently a tree would predict this input as a good or a bad class and we have multiple such trees uh, which work together in okay. uh, which work together and each of them would predict a class and uh, we come we aggregate the data over uh, all the trees to uh, decide on the final class uh, and XGBoost is kind of an improvement on top of decision trees where it learns from the mistakes committed by the previous decision tree to uh, make prediction. Uh, so the advantages with XGBoost are, it's, it's uh, though it is very simple, it's, it typically works very well with structured or tabular data, which is what we have. And uh, it's easy to interpret because it would throw out a decision tree that it came up with, and you can easily analyze uh, that. And one really important uh, thing about XGBoost is it, it would give you the feature importance. It would tell you like if you have a bunch of input features, it would tell you what features are important. This is basically reusable. If you are uh, moving on to other techniques, you could only use the features that uh, XGBoost or any other feature importance algorithms told you that it was important. So uh, my colleague Nitin would uh, go over some of the other techniques. Uh, so thanks, Raveen and Prasanna. So I will go ahead with the next modeling technique we tried, neural networks. So neural networks work quite well, as we all know, in uh, image <coughs> and audio data sets where they try to classify whether it's a cat or a dog or even a more complicated example of trying to use it in computer vision tasks for autonomous cars and also for trying to understand uh, audio to text. So given such human uh, like level performance for neural networks, we also tried them on our problem set using the same data set and using the same input features so that we can compare and contrast how this type of modeling technique works for us. So as Praveen mentioned, so uh, we are using the same geographical and device and browser related metrics as inputs to the model and we expect it to output the network quality uh, from the model. So as you can see, uh, the neural network is a bunch of layers stacked on top of each other. And the first layer takes these inputs, which are kind of encoded in the form of numbers. And the second layer takes the 
output transformations of this first layer and then passes this information along till the output layer. The output layer then uses this information, compares it with the source of, source of truth, and then passes the result or a grade back till the beginning of the first layer. And then that's how in an iterative manner, they tend to learn and then they get better over time. So uh, that's a very quick overview of like what neural networks do and how we used them uh, to achieve the same task. Uh, so we observed a, a very uh, modest improvement of two to 5% in some performance metrics uh, given like the using these over other decision, decision trees like techniques. So however, uh, besides the accuracy and performance, I think these are also some important advantages and disadvantages we should know before jumping into neural networks. One is due to the nature of the design of the problem and the way they train, neural networks tend to generalize better on unseen data sets. They don't, they have various techniques, uh, more advanced techniques to prevent or curtail the amount of overfitting is what we call, uh, try to learn too much from the data they have been trained on. So that's one good thing about neural nets. And the second thing is uh, due to things like embeddings, uh, which are uh, relatively kind of only present in neural nets as far as I know, uh, which help us try to learn unique representations of these uh, categorical features which Praveen was saying. So you can learn a representation in the form of numbers for say uh, uh, iOS uh, string. So, and another unique representation say for Chrome. So using these representations, we can learn how different uh, browsers or different OSs correlate with each other, what two browsers are similar to each other, what two OSs are similar, and many such countries, how do countries cluster together with respect to performance. So not only that, with embeddings, those unique representations, uh, we can transfer them to another problems using, uh, which are in the same domain, and start, have a warm start or a kick start for the next problem to solve, uh, rather than start training from the scratch. So that technique is what we call as transfer learning. So embeddings enable us to do such cool things. So, and another good thing is these are learned and not provided by the user. So we are not trying to say, this is how you have to represent browser. So these are learned as part of the training process in the, by the model itself. So, uh, and as we all know, like TensorFlow is one of the TensorFlow and PyTorch of many such libraries have become very popular on GitHub and we have seen explosion of uh, users and the interest in these in the last few years. They help us not only write a prototypical code, but also production ready and uh, code that can really work on distributed systems and at scale on huge data sets. So that such thing and the community is vibrant and we can like get help. So though that also is a very good sign of using neural nets and this is the right time to try it, is what we like, it's from our experience. And uh, as one other thing is, uh, there is a huge advantage if we have large data sets for using neural networks. So as we feed more and more data, the complex networks can really take advantage of it and they don't plateau the accuracy as early as the other classical neural networks. So if you have more data, you can really tip the accuracy and push it a little ahead further uh, by feeding in more training data. And it generalizes even better. And these are all the good sides, but the downside is there are a lot more conceptual uh, topics that are needed to understand and to tune manually. Like how do we know the number of neurons in each layer? How do we know the layer number of layers? And what are the SLAs once we deploy them to productions? And we need amazing infrastructure to uh, train these, like lots of GPUs and clusters of machines working in tandem for doing distributed training. So all these complications are still there, uh, but uh, to keep in mind when we are uh, planning to use neural networks. Uh, so once we have either of the models ready, we deployed them in production uh, currently in this fashion. So this is one way of deployment. We call this offline uh, deployment of a model. So we take our raw real user monitoring or RUM uh, 
performance data. We transform it into a format that the models can understand that is probably some form of numbers. We call it training data. And then uh, we train the model offline, uh, like over a period of hours or days, how much ever it takes. And then uh, once the model is trained, we use some form of historical data and save the predictions in a key value store. So, uh, so that we are meeting the SLAs of our uh, teams who want to use this service at LinkedIn. This is our current infrastructure we are using for deploying models in, in uh, production. Uh, so once the model is deployed, we kind of break, uh, have this kind of scheme. We try to have multiple models running in production just to see the accuracies we observe in our lab are how well are they matching with our NAB experiment to see the metric we care about. So we have one set of users which no model, one set of users which a very stable model, major percentage, and a small set of users with another model. So we can try and learn, okay, accuracy of the model A is doesn't really mean is good uh, because it's, say, hurting the revenue or something. So this way we have uh, our experiments live today. Uh, once we deployed, once we saw everything uh, working well, so now we have our first model result study, and which really uh, kind of inspired us, and we felt all our hard work came to uh, like a good point. So we saw huge improvement, as you can see on uh, the x-axis is the relative percentage improvement. On the y-axis, each of the metrics we cared about. Uh, like the number of unique members improved, the number of actions, because this was uh, implemented on LinkedIn feed, we saw actions also improve a lot because the images load faster on feed based on the predictions made by the model. And the number of shares and messages also sent also improved quite significantly. So uh, uh, I think, uh, yeah. So next, uh, what are you planning to do more? with ML, Prasna Welch. Thanks, Praveen and Nitin. Phew, that was too much details. I don't know how many of you even followed. I didn't. Uh, but here's what we plan to do next. We want to scale this. We, we are thinking of scaling NQS, not just at LinkedIn, but try to push, make it open source, get contributions from the industry, and let everyone take the benefit. And beyond that, we want to do more with AI for performance, as in things like image compression. We know there are so many al algorithms, and some algorithms do better in some cases, and others do better in others. Why not build an AI which will know what to do, which algorithm or which approach to pick to get the best image compression possible? That's something we are exploring. Root cause analysis for performance regressions instead of people sitting and looking at charts manually and debugging, spending hours and hours, can we get points, hints, and guidances from an automation system, an AI, that can say, hey, I think you should be looking in this direction, not that, right? That's another thing we are exploring as well. And then even uh, more advanced topics like predictive prefetching. Hey, a member at this time is loading this page. W what page are they going to go next? Let's prefetch it so it loads really fast for them. Right? Ideas like that. The well, last one, definitely not the least, that I'm very passionate about, and my colleague who will be talking to you next, David, uh, is driving this, carbon efficient computing. How do we save the world and use AI for it? The opportunities are limitless. Let's explore them together. Talk to us. Thank you. Any questions? So, uh, what what kinds of variables are changed for a in the in the app experience for a good versus a slow? The first one we tried was just playing with images. Mm -hmm. Just what should be the quality of images that are loading, and then we are looking currently at rendering videos. Okay. Right. So the the question that comes out of that, and this is some this is not unique to this work. This is uh, 
sort of something that we all have to deal with, is that this could perpetuate an entrenched disadvantage. Uh, that is, you're from a place, you have a particular kind of network, you have a particular kind of phone, you're going to see this content maybe from now on, even if the network changes, even if the device changes. Uh, what kind of thought do you guys have about how to avoid that trap? Sure, uh, that's actually a good question and we have thought about that. It's just one of the models that's running. Uh, how much importance we want to give to this model is up to the use case. So. Uh, yes, we are working with specific teams to start with, but uh, we don't have guidelines laid out because it's early stages for us too. But that's something we have to look at too. Yep, yeah, all of us. Hi, Alexander from Facebook, from MobilePerf. Uh, where do you, for neural networks and network quality in particular, where do you get training data? You need vast majorities of training data for it, but at the same time, getting it beforehand is hard. So how do you deal with that? So uh, for both the models that we tried, we get the training data from uh, real user monitoring. Uh, I think it would be called different names and different companies. So it's basically from the post message that gets sent out uh, from the client. Hey, so you're looking at uh, geography network device browsers. Do you, uh, have you been looking at what user like to, like, you know, personalize it on a per user basis? You know, they might like different type of posts, or they might be reading a lot or writing or. <coughs> um, yes, Th so this is, more like a POC for us to make sure this approach works. Right? And what we learn is yes, it's, it's an overwhelming yes. But uh, personalizing performance really means for each member, uh, understand what they want and then deliver that experience. And that is not gonna be limited only to performance metrics. We want to tie performance metrics that we have, all the data that we collect for performance with other metrics like how engaged are they, what how long are they living on the session? What, what is the performance metric when they are dropping out of the app? And things like that. And understand all of that to actually deliver the best possible experience and performance for each member. That is our goal. Can you share more on that or you're start, uh, starting? Not at this point, but we are we're getting started on that. But that is our goal. That is our theme, personalizing performance. So the so this is Samir from Google again. The, so the initially the set of variables that you described that are going into your network are not that large. So I was a little bit surprised that you had to use a lot of compute power to train that network. So that's part one of the question. Part two of the question is, did you then go back and look at what the network had learned and was there a simpler way of, like after the discovery had been done, is there just a simple, maybe a regression or some simple object that actually both explains uh, why the decisions are being made the way they are, and it doesn't require you to run an entire net network at runtime to do this. Uh, good question. So just to clarify the, the input data that we showed, uh, they are the categories of data, but the actual data itself that went in was much larger than that. Right? Um, so that, that's one of the reasons we went with a neural net f uh, for this use case. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, what was the second question? Did you try to work, backwa did you try to work oh, yeah. backwards from the network to figure out what was the decision-making rule? Um, do you want to go? Um, I think. So the main motivation of the feature importance or XGBoost is to like learn what features are important and then use those like to understand what the model is learning and then see later if we can push that accuracy further. So we started with simple baseline models and observed or a random model, even even basic, uh, and then gradually improved and we saw certainly there is an improvement in our data set given the complex correlations because it's a very tough metric to predict on, page load time, right? It's an end, end metric. So we certainly saw going more complex, but yeah. Were you able to work backwards to saying, uh, this is uh, this is the functional relationship between the inputs 
that gives rise to the page load time metric. So what's like, how are the each of these metrics correlated? Yeah, how, like what is the actual prediction, uh, uh, like sort of prediction value of these? That's orders. the feature importance score, right? Like in one way, how to look at, so is ASN more important than browser or more important than uh, like OS? That's one way to look at these features or you're saying like exact correlation or is that what you're actual functional relationship? No, I think we didn't try those. That's mo model interpretability. Yeah, we didn't try the model interpretability aspects for okay, that's neural that's networks. That's, that's what I'm asking. Yeah. Okay. A quick one. Um, how static is the model that you generate? Uh, is it, do you need to update that model all the time? And so how often? So currently we are in the third iteration of the models. Um, the plan is to continue retraining an existing model. So we've defined metrics to watch for, to figure out when we really have to scrape out a model and build a completely new one, but that's not gonna happen very often. What will happen like every two weeks once is an existing model will retrain with new sets of data. So it won't be like building a new model, but just keep training it on the newer data that keeps coming up. Hi, Nick here from Facebook. I think my question is related to some of the earlier questions around the inputs. Do you have data around which of the inputs was most predictive of network quality? Like which one dominated the decision? Uh, yes, so that is what the feature importance gives us. I don't know if I can so tell you the answer now. I, I guess you maybe yeah. aren't able to reveal it, but do you basically, does it result in one of them dominates the equation that usually happens? Uh, not yeah. one particular metric, that's what, if it was one, then we don't need a model. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, n not one particular ones, but we do have a set of top ones. So I think we, we started with like what, 200? Uh, input features, 200 different features that would actually, uh, that are actually available to use. And then we shortlisted like 17 or 18 of them. I see. 